Hi and good evening. So happy to welcome you tonight to our town hall meeting on underage drinking prevention. My name is Gina Kahn. I'm here um, as the director of the Hamden Wilbraham Partners for Youth Coalition. And before we get our program underway, and, and thank you for those that are just coming in, please come, come sit in the front. It's okay. <laughs> um, there are just a few little housekeeping things that I would like to tend to. So first of all, always safety first. Please be aware of where the exits are in case of an emergency. If, you, if we would need to evacuate, you would leave. Um, through either of these doors and proceed to your nearest exit. Um, also, please think about, if you can, put your cell phones on mute or vibrate. Um, we do understand that we are all living in a very connected world and that that's important. But also, um, please, just anything that, that might help to enhance your experience here tonight, um, please take care of that, including self-care. If you need to get up and stretch, please do that. Um, I want to say a really super big thank you to our coalition coordinator, and she's she's still buzzing around here, but this is Bree Burnash, and she is a fairly recent addition, about a year actually, um, to our coalition, but has been a phenomenal force in getting the coalitions the much needed attention in the community, making sure that, um, that we become more visible, and that the mission of the coalition, which is to network our community from any corner that you are in, whoever you are and whatever you do, understand that you have a role in the coalition, and the coalition being that collaboration of parents and partners youth serving agencies, our wonderful law enforcement, our wonderful DA's office. Um, but if I start naming them, I'm going to leave people out, so I won't. However, just know that if you are here tonight, you are part of this work. You are already part of this work. We hope that you will join us in a little bit more of an active way. But in the meantime, just a huge thank you to Bree for everything that you've done to bring us here tonight. You're going to hear more from Bree tonight, as, as I promise. I, I, I really don't want to keep the microphone. Along those lines, however, it is my pleasure to introduce our moderator for tonight, Dr. Chris Overtree. Um, Chris has worked with our district for a number of years. He comes from the mental health side um, at University of Massachusetts. He's been involved in the School of Education, the School of Psychology program, and other things that I'm sure that he will share. In your folder, by the way, is a list of our presenters for tonight, as well as their backgrounds and bios. So we're not gonna go into every detail on that, but please take a peek at that. We are so excited to have Chris and his expertise. And um, with that, we are gonna get started. Thank you so much. Um, huge thank you to Hamden Wilbraham and Minichog and all of the talented people in district and here representing our communities for bringing us together around this important topic. Um, again, my name is Chris Overtree. I'm a clinical psychologist. Uh, clinical psychology teaches you how to work with people who are experiencing mental health symptoms. And when you learn to work with children, your training is primarily around working with what is going on inside them that is causing mental health symptoms. Well, I'm here today and I work with schools because in my experience, I've rarely seen children and adolescents who are struggling from something that came exclusively inside them. The environmental impacts that our children and adolescents face are just too significant that if we don't look at them, if we don't pay attention to them, then uh, everyone's health suffers. So I'm here today to really talk to you and put that in a framework as we think about the very important topic of underage drinking and how it affects our community. I wanna start by telling you a story. Um, some of you may be aware that we recently went through a pandemic. And um, at the moment when we started returning to schools, 
uh, in person, I started to get some calls because I work with a lot of schools and my colleagues at UMass as well. And one of them was, can you come in and help us because the seventh graders are having food fights in the cafeteria. And the question was, what is wrong with these kids? And in fact, it wasn't just adults that were asking these questions. The ninth grade students were like, what is wrong with these seventh graders? Well, what was wrong was that many of these students left elementary school, and the next time they showed up was middle school. And what was wrong was that we had forgotten how much important instruction and mentoring and experience that happens just by being in the enriching environment of school. And we as adults and even clinicians and educators might say what is wrong instead of kind of recognizing what can we do in the environment? What can we change in the environment? How can we improve the environment to make sure um, that our kids learn what they need to learn, that they have access to what they need uh, to have access to in order to thrive? So there's a little bit of a danger when you talk about underage drinking and the deleterious effects of alcohol to say that same thing. What is wrong when we start to recognize problems? We're observing problems. Our goal as adults and uh, community members and the goals of our youth leaders that are here today is to try to unpack how can we all work together uh, to support this. So why is, um, why is this so important? Um, alcohol itself is the direct cause of many physical, mental, social, emotional problems. More importantly, it's a substance that actually at a certain point in your consumption actually takes over your body. So it is not always a matter of just will and willpower and decision making. At a certain point in, a, in addiction, you no longer have the same kind of choices that you do when you're thoughtfully thinking about the actions you're gonna take. It's also an indirect measure of stress. We can look at alcohol use in a community and we can, roughly speaking, use that uh, substance abuse, substance use rate as a measure of the kinds of stressors that might be present in that community. It's very important to recognize, of course, that all of our messaging around alcohol consumption is inside also an industry and a country where there's actually a business model associated with alcohol. So even the messaging that has both kind of positive connotations and even the relationship that the alcohol industry has with uh, youth and with educators and health providers has to be taken in the context of the, the profit and the money that is part of that, that industry. Um, I think it's fair to say we adults haven't figured it out either. And we are some of the ones that are, are doing these communications. So what I want to talk to you about today um, is how important it is to delay the beginning of alcohol consumption in youth. That is so important in terms of giving um, their emotional selves, their intellectual selves, their brain selves, their body selves, this kind of tools that they need to make the decisions that are right for their future self. So part of what we're here today is to really think about underage drinking. And I want to share some data with you. This data comes from your district. Why is it important here? Now, one of the things I'd like to say is we have a lot more expertise in this room um, that I want to hear from. My job is to really kind of pull out the questions that will be relevant for all of us to be thinking about. I want to make sure we have time for questions at the end to hear from you. And the presenters uh, will not need to rush but we should all just understand we're trying to achieve a balance between receiving information and having dialogue. And I'll do my best to try to have that happen. And in modeling that, I'm going to be pretty quick in looking at a lot of data to make a little bit of a summary here. And what you see here, um, data on usage in this community, as you can see, although it appears to be going down, what we see is that no matter what we think about tobacco and marijuana, marijuana being a particularly um, kind of obvious substance given its recent legalization, alcohol remains, even at the eighth grade level, to be one of the most significant uh, early access substances. And as we look 
upwards, what you see is, what, is that alcohol starts to float up as a substance that is becoming more normative. So we're not wrong to be focusing here, despite what we may see or think uh, in our own communities. Attitudes are really important. You see younger children are pretty certain that their parents will disapprove of alcohol consumption. And they're somewhat certain, quite moderately certain, that their peers may too. Our eighth graders are still in that place where they kind of reasonably can describe what an optimal healthy behavior would be, what it would look like, what they would hope that their peers would engage in, what they would expect their parents would. That changes over time. And this shouldn't surprise us, of course, but we need to recognize how influential both the attitudes about alcohol, our perceptions about what other adults think of, of, of the use of alcohol in children and how that changes as ages go up. What we think as adults matters. What we communicate as adults matters. Our kids, our adolescents are listening even when we don't think they are. They're definitely watching. And this is a generation that I can't wait to put into the driver's seat in our, in our country. So we have so much to learn from them. And uh, while they're growing into the adults that are going to be here taking care of our country and world, I hope we, um, at this point, can be thoughtful about how we can nurture that, um, that future as well as we can. Curtis, um, I just realized that I neglected, because I wasn't looking at my notes, to talk about a couple of additional housekeeping things. Um, so Chris just talked about the opportunity to ask questions and how important that is. So there's a couple of ways to do that. And this is supposed to be a town meeting format. So when we get to the end, we really are going to be inviting you to come to the microphone. We will pass the microphone to you. Not everybody loves the microphone, and some of you have already shared questions with us in advance, and Brie will be helping to make sure that those questions get to our panel. If you have questions, we have some index cards that you can use to, to write those questions down, and if you wave the index card, one of us will come and get it from you. And we also do have a QR, yes, am I right about that, a QR code? That's for the, the end. Uh, that's for the evaluation at the end. So don't forget to do your evaluation at the end. We have a QR code that will take you there. But if you do have a question in the meantime, we will distribute, we're happy to distribute these index cards and we hope that we'll hear from you. So with that, let's get back to the panel. Please, please do share your questions because although we won't be able to get to all of them, they will tell us a lot about what kind of written materials we might like to prepare and share uh, when we're done in addition to the slides. So I would, uh, in the interest of time and preserving time for discussion and questions, I really would like to ask you, you know, normally we would make uh, lots of introductions of everybody. We have such a talented group of people here. I really would encourage you to read the bios as they come along and allow me to just uh, hand over the mic to them so they can share their expertise and thoughts with us. And first, it's my uh, privilege to invite Assistant District Attorney Curtis Frick uh, up to the microphone. So again, my name is Curtis Frick. I'm a prosecutor with the District Attorney's Office, Hamden County. Uh, District Attorney Galuni, your DA. Uh, thank you for having me here today. I've been a prosecutor about, this is my 23rd years being a prosecutor. I've worked at everything from uh, shoplifting to murder cases and the bulk in between. Uh, my majority of what I've been doing work for the last 15 years or so is in the juvenile court. Uh, chief of the juvenile unit and run a diversion program as well as all prosecutions that come through Hamden County including indictments. Uh, and this is great being able to come out into the community and do this work and get out of the courtroom and I appreciate the opportunity to be able to be here and share really what my core tonight is really dealing with is the laws 
Now, if you think about it, these laws reflect what your society, what your government is saying about uh, the parameters of what we believe is uh, acceptable for use and alcohol for those people. And it's not just our kids. I know we're in a high school setting here, but it's development of children, adolescents, and young adults, because what we're talking about is people under the age of 21. So you may have your junior, seniors in high school here, but you're also going to be, as parents, having to think about these same issues for your freshman, sophomore, kids who go on to college, or their home. And so all of that is something to reflect on what these laws are in regards to our young adults and children. So first is dealing with minors purchasing alcohol. And so this is how are the kids getting a handle uh, on the alcohol and other items. So this is the law. Any person under 21 who attempts to purchase alcohol, and there's different means of that, or even misrepresenting their age, trying to buy the alcohol and the liquor. And you can see the fines up here on the, on the screen. It's a $300 fine, but also a 180-day loss of license. So just the idea of trying to get your hands on the alcohol, if you're a minor, is, has the idea of trying to be prevention, okay? Have some kind of uh, means of deterrence. Next, minors actually possessing the alcohol or transporting it. So you have actually, they've gotten their hands on it, and what are we looking at? We're looking at kids under 21, who have gotten their hands on the alcohol one way or the other. Uh, and you'll notice the law, whether you're aware of it or not, it's not illegal for kids to possess alcohol with their parents. And this is kind of a theme that you're gonna be thinking about in social hosting, which we'll talk about soon enough. But the idea is that kids can't possess it. They can't transport it in the car. They can't have it on them, or there's a, it's a crime. It's a misdemeanor also. You'll see here it's a $50 fine first offense, and then the offenses go up for more payments. One of the more, I would say, traumatic aspects of this is they can be arrested for the possession of the alcohol. So it's a minor misdemeanor crime, but if the police catch you in your car, at the park, some other location, and have these or open containers, they, will, they can arrest you, and they most likely will because they can't just let Somebody who's maybe intoxicated walk away, sees the beer, sees the, whatever the object is, and just let you go on your way. So it's traumatic having to be arrested, handcuffed, put in a booking. Now, this deals with something in the um, 18, 19, 20 year old range at college. So if you're thinking about that for your kids who are going away, open containers, they will get arrested on the street or in a car, and that will affect them as well. So, furnishing alcohol to minors. Now, this goes into definitions, okay? Here you can see the definition, whoever makes a sale or delivery, and really what we're talking about is delivery, because it's not really the people who are making the sales of, and we're just talking about one person giving it to another. That's delivery. Alcoholic beverages to any person under 21, either for his own use or the use of his parents or any other person. Now, here where the crime gets up, you start having $2,000 worth of fine or imprisonment for jail for a year or both. So now we're really worried about how and who is giving alcohol to others. And as a society, we're looking at these. You attempt to get something, it's a minor fine. You actually possess it, it increases in punishment, ideas of that in nature. And then we are looking at some of these definitions. Okay, whoever is defined by the law as whatever person, any person at all, no matter who. So you don't have to be over 21 to be furnishing alcohol to another person. It's whoever. So one 14-year-old can be providing it to another 14-year-old, and they've committed the crime of furnishing alcohol to another person. So it applies to everyone, above and below 21. House parties, what are we talking about here? Furnishing is this definition. Knowingly or intentionally supply, give, or provide 
or allow, that's the key word here, a person under 21 years of age, except for children and grandchildren, of that exception as we talked about before, charged to possess the alcohol on premises or property owned or controlled by the person charged. So here, if you own a home, rent a home, or you're in charge of a particular property, and you allow people who are under 21 to drink alcohol, possess it or use it, that are not your children, you're committing the crime. So, this is I know about alcohol, but just a little segue, so I'll have pop parties at my house. No, you cannot be doing that either. It's furnishing. Whatever mores of the laws and decriminalizations for adults with marijuana, it is not for those under 21. And you allowing people to drink in your home or smoke in your home, those are crimes. So now we get into, okay, people have a party at the house. The kids are drinking. I'm allowing them, and they think, oh, it's better than them driving around or being somewhere else. We have to have some thoughts into this. Whose kids are at your house drinking? Would you approve of your child drinking at someone else's house without your permission? What is your relationship with those parents? Do they really know? And do they approve of it? Most parents do not approve of their children being given alcohol substances by other people's parents. And our laws and society say, no, you're the parent, you decide what your kids have, not other parents. So when we have a problem or alcohol or furnishing issues, it's usually because something really bad has happened. Like a young person has died, or maybe an innocent, unrelated third party has been injured. So you have this crime of involuntary manslaughter. You knowingly allow a minor to drink alcohol and they die because of the alcohol consumption, you can be charged with involuntary manslaughter. It's reckless. Specifically have prosecuted this case before in a different county where a parent provided a 1.75 liter bottle of vodka to their daughter. Said, here, it's yours. Do it as you wish. Just don't let your other parent find out. Thought he was being the cool dad. Well, going past New Year's into January, February, she had this alcohol at her disposal. Her and her friend picked it up and took a 20 ounce Poland Springs bottle, brought it over to her friend's house, and they did shots and drinking in the afternoon. And this was years ago when internet was still starting as far as video conferencing kind of thing. They didn't even call it that back then, but one of the girls goes and takes a shower. Her friend's like, hey, Where's so-and-so? I'll go check on her. Finds her. She drowned. Blood alcohol, 0.31. Alcohol intoxication and drowning. 14, 15-year-old girl. Unsupervised access to alcohol. So that parent, he was prosecuted. He had a DA complaint for manslaughter. And he pled to it. So, and there is differences. These kids don't understand how liquor versus beer, and none of it's okay, but the effects and the outcomes can be quite dramatic. This girl didn't have any idea how this alcohol is going to affect her body. Reckless endangerment. Maybe it doesn't go toward death. People get hurt, paralyzed, injured, alcohol poisoning, and there's the reckless endangerment, so you could be charged with that. Contributing to delinquency of a minor. So you provide that alcohol to another person. You can also be charged with contributing to delinquency of that minor's crimes. You've caused them to possess alcohol, which is a crime to them. So you're causing them to have a potential criminal record. So there is gradations here, obviously, with the penalties. And what happens with the consequences? So a lot of times we don't hear about this stuff until something really bad happens. Last year we had in our county something really bad happen with the alcohol in a house and somebody driving 
and somebody dying and somebody being seriously injured. It didn't happen in your town, but it wasn't far away. And unfortunately, those are the things you hear about, and you don't hear about all the other problems that are associated with alcohol and allowing it to happen in your home. Not to mention the civil side of things. You host a party, your child hosts a party, you can be responsible civilly and lose money, lose a house, insurance, does it cover it? And going back a little bit to the control aspects, who's controlling those premises? You go out of town, you're at the Cape, you're off at the mountains, you're doing something and you left your senior at home and they have a party. They're in control of those premises and you left them home. You may not have that criminal liability, but they may if they allow those other friends to bring the alcohol into the house and to have a party there. And then somebody got hurt, somebody got injured, you, have the li you may not personally have the liability, but your child may, or your person who, your uh, child who comes home from college. Okay. Minors and alcohol consumption. Increased risks associated with teen drinking. Teens may not realize how impaired they are. We talked about over intoxication. Alcohol poisoning. Incidents of serious injuries due to falls. People are inebriated, they fall, they trip, they're out in the woods, they get lost with their friends, they get hurt. You can look up the statistics and see what they are. Injuries from falls, neck injuries, head injuries, concussions, broken bones, it happens. It's not as serious, it doesn't hear, it doesn't make the, the news. People don't talk about it, but those happen. We see it happen, and it only comes to light when a person has to complain about it. Now, what else do we have here? We obviously have diminished senses of judgment, right? They're impaired. Teens take risks uh, that they may not otherwise. Higher risk of violence, causing fights among each other. Okay? Inabilities to control their emotions. Lower inhibitions. Sexual consent issues. Rape. Indecency touchings. You think, oh, I have a house party, but the kids all sleep in the backyard. They're 18, 17 years old. You don't have any idea how much they're actually consuming. If you think you're that parent that's like, oh, I'm going to let them eat here and drink, you're not sitting with them, drinking with them most likely, but you're allowing that to happen. You don't know all the things that are happening in between, how intoxicated people are getting. You don't know how individual people are, what they're taking for personal medications. So those things are all the risks. And yes, you see at the bottom, I put there, the risks associated with driving a vehicle. That is the most obvious that people think about, but you gotta think about the other things too. And those do affect kids, and they affect your home, potentially. Here's some scenarios. Jane, 10th grader, one morning she sneaks a bottle of vodka out of her house and brings on the school bus. She drinks some and then shares with two other kids on the bus. Who's committed crimes here? What kind of crimes? Well, Jane stole the liquor, it wasn't hers, to take from her parents, and it's larceny. Then she's possessing the alcohol, that's a crime. Then she's furnishing it, delivering it to another, to two kids, that's two crimes. And then she's on potentially on school property or school busing. So the school, if they get involved, may suspend her. Okay? Police can get involved. And it becomes more public. Yes, juvenile crime is private. But you get caught in school, people talk, people know. Now, any actions to be taken by the parents or the school? The school I mentioned, right? The parents, probably not against them in this situation, because they didn't allow it. They were stolen. They, were, they had their property taken away from them. But the police, and the school's going to have to do something. They can't just allow the alcohol to sit there and stay there. So they have to report it to the police. They can't just put it in a drawer and say, oh, this was just a mistake. 
they have to report it to the police. Okay, another scenario. John has a get-together in his basement with his friends who are all under 21. Parents are home and know some of the kids have brought their own alcohol and marijuana to consume. But they feel they know all the kids and they have taken the car keys away. This happens in your community. This happens in everyone's community. But our society and our laws say no. And you, there's only so many of us in here in this room, and thank you for being here. You're here because you care, and you're concerned, and you want information. Maybe you know most of this, maybe you don't. But I ask you, it is part of your job to be able to have and communicate this information to other parents. It's really hard if you have a junior or senior child. You don't want to make them that pariah by being the one who's turning in the party house. But sometimes the alternative is really things go wrong. So ask the questions for your team. Where are they going out? If you're that parent that does not want your child drinking at other people's homes, be proactive. Where are they going out that night? Whose house are they going to? Do you know those parents? Are you approving of those parents and what's their um, take? And it's hard to say, yeah, I'll call them up and do that when you don't know them. Or getting that kind of call and feeling like, oh, you think I, I'm one of those kind of parents? There's a lot of social pressures on both the parent side and the kid side. But communication, talking with your kids about what they approve of and what you approve of them doing and not doing is important. So we talked a little bit more about those crimes there potentially. Something bad happens in that home, the parents are potentially liable for furnishing the alcohol, social hosting there, liabilities if somebody got hurt at their party. So this is not the fun stuff here that I get to talk about, but I can tell you what, I'd rather be talking to you about prevention and intervention efforts and having to deal with the, not deal with, but having to work with the families that have been hurt, injured, because they've lost a loved one. And it's the community making the decisions of how to handle alcohol, teen alcohol use, and younger, under 21. Any questions? <coughs> Unless we're doing at the end. And... We're gonna have a big slate of questions at the end. I'm gonna do my best to be watching the audience to see if there's an eager hand, but I, if, if I will, I wanna ask a question on behalf of the room that I think um, may be on people's minds. A, a couple of times, the, the law differentiates the behavior of a parent towards their own child and uh, and of course your scenario about a child taking parents from uh, taking liquor from her parents I just can you say a little bit about the responsibilities parents have with their own children and how they are different or or similar and how, any advice you give and related to that uh, do parents need to take uh, specific proactive actions to secure alcohol in their home uh, like they would weapons could you speak to those two things? Well, there's no law. I, I can't give you legal advice here, but there's no law that you have to lock up your alcohol like you do a weapon that's in the home, particularly when I mean a weapon, a firearm. So, no, there's no legal responsibility, but if you have a child that you know is taking your liquor and stealing it all the time, then you should be doing something about that or protecting it or not having it in the house. And there's probably deeper issues in there if it's happening more than once. Um, so. Is there potentially liability issues if somebody is able to prove? Potentially. But the law doesn't say that you have to have it locked up. I don't know if that answers the question. But, uh, but there are differences in regards to um, not so much parents and adults versus children when it comes to delivery and allowing the use of the alcohol. Because when it comes to that, that idea of whoever can be charged. So it's not just parents, you know, older sibling. Okay, you might look at them as all kids, but that older sibling who's 22 and buys it for their younger, they're committing crimes too, potentially. Thank you so much. I'm gonna keep us on track, so, and please uh, write down, thoughtfully uh, remember your questions for the end, and um, 
Curtis, thank you so much for thank you all for that you've shared today. Um, you know, Curtis mentioned the challenges when you don't necessarily know the parents of your children's friends. And of course that's a challenge. It's mitigated somewhat by uh, being in a small community. It's made harder when your community gets bigger. And of course the intermingling of technology and all that. One thing I will say is that events like this and your participation and your school's engagement with these kind of preventive efforts is part of what creates norms in your community so that parents can start to more reliably count on each other to hold some of the same uh, attitudes and beliefs. And so one of the things we can do as parents is just share those beliefs and be communicative and talkative and try to break down those barriers so people know that we're kind of, we are allies together uh, in this. Um, it's my great privilege to introduce uh, some students from the Youth, Youth Advisory Board. Um, in my work with schools, I have never met a more important force in, for good in schools than the youth that uh, step up to take leadership. And so I'm gonna hand it over to you for what you have to share with us today. Thank you so much. Hi, good evening everyone. Uh, my, name, my name is Gina Anselmo and I'm, I'm from the Community Safety and Outreach Unit at the Hamden District Attorney's Office. I'm not gonna be up here for, for long. I just wanted to briefly introduce the DA's Youth Advisory Board. Um, the Youth Advisory Board program is a group of about 62 high school students representing 23 high schools across Hamden County. And their role, they meet with our office on a monthly basis and they talk about some of the issues that they see in their schools and communities and they create projects to address them. So we give them a platform to, to you know, present their projects and talk about things that, that they see and that they're passionate about. So one of our committees is substance use, so they have been having conversations about the issue of underage drinking. And they will be sharing the, their youth perspective today and also sharing a project that they created last year, uh, a quick 30 second PSA that addresses the, the dangers of, of uh, underage drinking. So I will let them take it away. I'm Emily Estevez. Um, I go to Minichog. By middle school, I was already hearing about people vaping in the bathrooms and drinking alcohol, but it was really only prominent in high school. When it comes to drinking, Almost any party that I see posts on social media, there is a cup of alcohol covered by a Snapchat filter so the photo can't be used against them. There is plenty of underage drinking at these parties from freshmen to seniors, and many try very hard to hide it. Getting home isn't easy for most of them, with many likely sneaking out or lying about where they are going. Many end up sleeping at a friend's house, getting their friend in trouble, or putting themselves at risk either driving themselves or being driven by someone who may not be sober. I don't believe that discipline can stop students from drinking, but initiating conversation may not, that many have not had um, yet would definitely help. Sorry. Little context, I am from Springfield. Uh, my name is Blanca Amaya. I go to Springfield Honors Academy and I am in 12th grade. As someone from Springfield and in, in the inner city, I've seen a lot of underage drinking and it's a big concern, especially when it affects public image. Teens may not realize it sometimes, but what they post online stays online forever. And if it falls into the wrong hands, then their life or their future can be severely negatively impacted or ruined. Employers and college admissions always look at potential candidates' social medias. It's important how they present themselves. Some of the underclassmen at my school, like the sophomores and juniors, get together and drink and smoke and post it all over their social medias, which I would like to say, um, there's a way where you can create uh, friend stories, where you can post it on your stories and friends will see it, but it's also very important where you don't know who are your friends, you don't know who is uh, selecting who is screenshotting your post and who is posting it public for everyone else to view. Again, so people were gossiping about a girl at my school 
that was crying on the floor while drunk, while another girl, who she assumes was her friend, was just laughing and recording. This is not only illegal, but it can also hurt how other people view them. Underage drinking is so common, but it's not nearly talked about enough. Alcohol consumption in, in general accounts for many deaths yearly and is even more dangerous when it involves teens. And I do believe a lot of teens start drinking due to either peer pressure or fear of missing out. So it's important to discuss and educate them. People not only lose their lives due to underage drinking, but it is also illegal and can lend, land them in jail. Hello, good evening. Uh, I'm Matt Favada, and I'm a senior at Lolo High School. So based on my experience and from what I've heard from other peers, many schools will say or advertise that they will be using breathalyzers at a school function so that there will not be any incidents or accidents. However, they never actually follow through. This makes students not take them as seriously as they would if they said, if they followed through. In the future, schools are doing a disservice to themselves by not following through because it makes students more likely to smuggle alcohol in or come to an event under the influence since the precedent set by the school was not to be true to their word. My advice to be, would be to follow through on whatever is said in the future so students know that the school has a zero tolerance policy when it comes to alcohol or drugs and that their safety is a top priority. I also think the biggest concern when it comes to underage drinking is not knowing to what the extent the harm could be. Most students simply do not understand that they could kill somebody or be killed for what they're doing. Uh, good evening, my name is John Fitzpatrick. Um, this is my third year on the Youth Advisory Board um, and I am the uh, president of the board this year. Um, and for all three years, I've been working on the Substance Use Committee, so I'll be getting to that a little bit later. Um, when it comes to underage drinking, some of my greatest concern falls on the futures of these students' lives. They're putting themselves in dangerous situations, blacking out, getting sick, possibly uh, alcohol poisoning, in spaces with numbers of intoxicated peers. And this, of course, is a real risk associated with the consumption of alcohol, especially in young people who have a limited sense of self-control. I've seen a substantial increase in alcohol use among my classmates, including some who I'd never expected to pick up an ounce of alcohol. Uh, I think peer pressure has certainly played a role, but I find that students who drink often feel stressed and use alcohol to numb their no, uh, loneliness, depression, or anxiety. So I think the topic of underage drinking is often overlooked or swatted away by adults and students alike, and there should be a greater focus on preventing students in middle schools from falling into this detrimental habit. The threat that alcohol abuse poses to local youth uh, is real and could grow worse if not addressed. If I had the perfect solution, I certainly wouldn't be here today. However, I would advise all parents to speak to their children about the negative effects and consequences of alcohol consumption and demonstrate responsible behaviors themselves. Finally, I'd like to address the accuracy of self-reported surveys because from what I hear uh, from students at my school, for example, they'll often lie regardless of whether the survey is listed as anonymous or not, and whether they lie due to legal reasons or moral reasons, that's beyond my knowledge, uh, but I can attest to having witnessed students openly discuss dishonesty with me and their other peers. Um, but take it from me, it's certainly a concern in this, uh, this community, my community in East Long Meadow, um, for safety in regards to underage consumption of alcohol. Uh, so last year on the Youth Advisory Board, I led the committee which addressed substance use, which I mentioned earlier, and we created this public service announcement to portray the fatal effects of mixing underage drinking with driving. And this PSA is titled Always 17. So I think Gina will be proud of it. Hello, my name is Gina. 
My older sister was 17 years old. She was my best friend my entire life, and I always wanted to be just like her. Her and her friends were in her room down the hall getting ready for prom. I waited up for her to come home to hear all about the dance, but she decided to go to the big after party. They left for the party, but my sister never came home. It was 2 a.m. My dad opened the front door to a police officer. My heart sank. I, I saw, saw the tears, tears in my dad's, dad's eyes. eyes. My sister and her friends had been drinking that night and didn't think twice about getting into the car. Their friend said he was fine to drive, but clearly he was not. They got into a head-on collision on the drive home. I'm now 18, but my older sister, she'll always be 17. One decision can change your life in a split second. If you or someone you know is struggling with alcohol addiction, help is available. Please be safe on the road. Good evening, everyone. My name is Layla Hostander, and I'm a freshman here at Medjock. So, no parent would ever want their teen to be consuming alcohol underage. However, if for some reason this did end up happening, parents and guardians need to make sure that their teen feels comfortable calling them or another trusted adult if they're under the influence. After taking into consideration the rise in teenagers driving under the influence, parents and guardians need to need to ensure they establish what they would want their teen to do if they did not have a safe and a sober ride home. Parents should never make their child feel scared to call them if they're in a dangerous situation. However, children should also always have another trusted adult they can contact in order to get home safely. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you will never walk into a group of students and ask questions about important weighty topics and not hear uh, just as intelligent and important uh, responses as you would hear anyway. Thank you so much for sharing your views. I just want to make one point. You know, what you all have done is really waded into a much more complicated space that reminds us about the role of discipline and the role of teaching. You know, your comments about not being able to use discipline to prevent alcohol consumption. Discipline and deterrence goes hand in hand with teaching and support and resources. And I just really appreciate how you just left us with a real awareness of how tricky this is. It's not, it's not always simple. And your comments about surveys as well. You know, I, I think you're, you're correct. Even anonymous surveys can sometimes bring uh, about uh, erroneous responses. Um, if I had to guess, mostly it would be underreporting. So uh, that means any marker that we're looking at may be an underreport, and that's something that we should all, always pay attention to. Um, thank you. It's my privilege to, it, to invite and introduce Detective Sean Casella and Student Resource Officer Dan Ryan uh, to come up and share their thoughts and views. Thank you so much. My older Very powerful stuff. You guys should be very proud of yourself. It's hard to get up in front of people and talk like this. Um, my name's Sean Casella. I'm a detective with the Wilbraham Police. I've been on the job for 20 years. I'll let Officer Ryan introduce himself in a second here. Um, it is hard to get up here. Now, I, I teach at the police academy, so I'm used to that environment. I'm used to teaching recruits and having them stand up and stand at attention when I walk in the room, right? That's, but it's a different environment when you when you are, are speaking to community members, and um, it's something that the people that have gotten up here already and spoken have, have just been amazing. I'm very very impressed with what the youth advisory board came up and said, and Curtis as well. Um, we all work together. I'll let Officer Ryan introduce himself uh, since you and I work very closely yeah. together. Um, I'm Officer Dan Ryan, and I am the new school resource officer for the district. Uh, the old officer, Menard, SRO, not old, but he retired. Uh, so he's sitting in the back today. Um, but yeah, uh, Detective Cassell is going to touch on some uh, OUI stuff and uh, stuff to look for as far as impairment. And then I'll touch on some school stuff. So um, I would ask a question. It can either be rhetorical or feel free to answer. Can we think of a crime that 
involves detection, apprehension, deterrence, prevention in a community um, involving a, an entire community that has a bigger effect on public safety than operating under the influence of alcohol. I mean, we don't knock on people's doors and say, hey, are you, are you having a disorderly conduct episode? You know, that's not something that we can be proactive with as police officers. We can be proactive with enforcement, detection, and apprehension of people who operate under the influence of alcohol. We as a community can use our resources like a night like tonight to deter that from happening. And these steps should be taken in every community, quite frankly. But I think it has an extreme effect on public safety to educate the youth, the residents, and, and you know have constant training as police officers to make sure that we're keeping up with the trends that are going on. How many times do you think someone drives drunk before they get caught? Someone throw a number out. 30, 10? 80 times in the statistics that we teach at the police academy, someone drives drunk 80 times before they're caught. Now, that could be over the course of a longer period of time, of course, but that's something that, that I don't think some of the youth understand. This is a crime that it happens because of the accessibility of alcohol. Anyone in here is very easy to get alcohol, even as a youth. Um, the social norms surrounding alcohol. You know, you had a, a student get up and talk about social media and, and seeing kids with alcohol bottles, but they're covering them, them up. Kids are keeping up with the times. They're aware of what we're looking for. And this is where it kind of begins. We want to try and deter that. But in my opinion, it starts at home. It starts in the community. And it starts with, with young role models for other students who may step in at some point and say, you know what? I saw this. This isn't right. Maybe here's some things you can think about. Or here's some programs. Or come join the Youth Advisory Board if you're out doing stuff you shouldn't be doing. You never know, right? You never know. Maybe something like that would have an effect. So I'll ask another question. There are typically three different kinds of alcohol that we, that we talk about. There's you know, your beer, your standard beer, your spirits, distilled spirits, so like vodka, whiskey, and wine. A 12 ounce beer has the same amount of alcohol as a 1.5 ounce shot of 80 proof whiskey and the same amount of alcohol as a five ounce glass of wine. Do we think that inexperienced youth who drive or consume alcohol do it responsibly? Do you think they're measuring out five ounces of wine? If you were to go to a restaurant and they only give you five ounces of wine, are you gonna go back there? Probably not as an adult, right? That's not very much. And one of those drinks can cause your blood alcohol level to go up 0.02 per hour. Now it's different for every person, but it's something you have to be cognizant of. So technically, if I were to consume one 12 ounce beer and wait an hour, that alcohol would be out of my system. But what we see with youth and adults, quite frankly, is that the alcohol is not consumed in that manner. Most people are uh, most youth, I don't think, are responsible when it comes to drinking. The responsible thing for people under 21 really should be not drinking. But in order to combat that with, you know, de deterrence and enforcement, we need to be aware of what we're looking for. So what are some things that we look for to figure out if someone's impaired? And notice I'm saying impairment and not drunk. <coughs> You don't have to be drunk in Massachusetts, drunk, to be found guilty for operating under the influence. Our standard is a diminished capacity to operate a vehicle, or the one that everyone thinks of is a .08 or greater, meaning they take the breath test and their blood alcohol concentration is .08 or greater. Doesn't have to just be that. And this applies for youth as well. Under 21, the same standard that same threshold of a diminished capacity. And what I mean by that is, when you drive a vehicle, you have to have the ability to divide your attention a bunch, uh, amongst a bunch of different tasks. So you see 
the light turned yellow. Now I know in Massachusetts that means go faster. <laughs> but technically, you see the light turn yellow, you have to process, okay, I gotta slow down, the red light's coming. At the same time, you're applying pressure to the brake. You're staying safely within the lane. You're making sure there's no other cars around you. All of these things are going on at once. And you start to introduce drugs or alcohol into that, it affects your ability to divide your attention. Now, how are some ways you as parents or members of the community can determine whether or not someone, simple ways, whether or not someone's impaired? The biggest thing, in my opinion, is communication, talking. Um, you know, I, no one in here, to my knowledge, is anyone in here an expert in detecting someone who's under the influence of alcohol? No, but we've all seen someone who's under the influence of alcohol, and you don't need specialized training for that. So you look for things like slurred words, uh, bloodshot and glassy eyes. One of the bigger ones is the odor of alcohol, right? Alcohol has a very distinct odor when it's processed by the body. Um, not all alcohol is treated the same, but when it's processed by the body, when you talk to your son or daughter, um, you should be able to smell that, that strong odor if they've consumed alcohol. And there are simple things that you can do as a parent. Have them say the alphabet. Just say the alphabet. We do this in, when, in training in the police academy. We have people close their eyes and bring their head to their chest and say the alphabet silently in their head and we time it. Typically takes someone about 13 seconds. That's about the average. Now I'm not suggesting that anyone that takes longer than 13 seconds is drunk. That's not what I'm suggesting. But it's a simple thing for you to ask your, your son or daughter, say the alphabet for me. Start at A and end at Z. Or if you want to divide their attention even more, start at D and end at Q. Someone who's consumed alcohol or drugs or both, which is another consideration, um, may not have the ability to do that. They may try and enunciate certain letters. They may slur their letters. They may miss letters. So that's a very simple thing as a parent and someone in the community you can do. Something else, and you know, I'm not up here teaching a field sobriety course, but I just want to give you some tools as parents and members of the community. Something very simple you can do, have your, your son or daughter, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. Very simple, one, two, three, four, four, three, two, one. You want to make it even more complicated, bring it outside of their field of view, because you're further determining whether or not they can divide their attention, okay? So if they can't divide their attention, why should they be driving a car? If they can't divide their attention due to alcohol or drugs, they should not be driving a car. So these are all considerations that we make, and those are easy things for you to do. But of course, the best of all is just have a conversation, ask them. Hopefully, the relationship you have with your, your son or daughter is good enough that you can have these conversations and you know, they'll be uh, forthright with you. Just to go over the law briefly, in Massachusetts, when you operate a vehicle on a public way with a blood alcohol concentration of 0.08 or greater or have a diminished capacity to operate a vehicle, that's the crime right there. Those are the elements. So is the parking lot of Minichaga public way? Some people might say no, but in fact it is. So some students or kids that think that they're going somewhere that's off the beaten path and it may not be considered a public way for purposes of operating under the influence of alcohol, they could be wrong. You know, we have had students in that park in a lot and, and consume alcohol, and that's, that's a dangerous place, but it's also still considered a public way for purposes of the statute. Now let's say we get a call for students being in the parking lot consuming alcohol. We show up, the car is running. We don't observe operating. We don't observe them driving, but the car is running. There's alcohol in the car. The driver is impaired. We, we can arrest them. We can arrest them the, by, the, by simply the car running in a parking lot, which the public has access to. That is the crime of OUI right there. So it doesn't take much. And then, of course, you know, Curtis talked about minor in possession of alcohol and some of the other ancillary crimes that could go along with that. So what happens? That person gets placed under arrest. They get brought back to the station. What happens? We offer them a breath test. So let's just say this person doesn't know any better. This 18, 19-year-old kid doesn't know any better. And they're like, I'm not going to take the breath test. Well, what happens? Are there penal There's penalties associated with that, right? 
Under 21, if you refuse to take the breath test, you'll lose your license for three years. So that's a big penalty. If you take the test and you fail it, you lose your license for 30 days. Uh, you also face administrative penalties of a year. You have to take a driver alcohol education program. You have to pay significant fines. Potentially probation comes into play where you have to pay probationary fines. And then of course the cost associated with, if, a, if the person chooses to, to take the case to court, you're looking at upwards of five, six, seven thousand dollars for a first offense OUI because someone for whatever reason, whether it be peer pressure or something else, made a poor decision. And it, you know, you, you saw a video of, of a 17 year old, an 18 year old girl who said her sister's always 17. And uh, quite frankly, it choked me up a little bit because in my 20 years, I've been to several fatal accidents and in very many of those fatal accidents, the person was under 21 and alcohol was involved. And there's no worse feeling than having to go to someone's house at two o'clock in the morning and tell five family members that their son or daughter died. So, um, there's a lot that can be done with this. I think we as a community in Wilbraham do a good job of it. I think it starts at home, and then it has kind of a trickle-down effect with community resources like the DA's office, the school resource officer, you know, Dan's going to talk about some of the penalties associated with the school, that we work very closely. You know, Dan is not on an island here. We work very closely, and, and we see the effects of not only driving under the influence, but simply being under the influence when you're under 21. So you, you'll, you can yeah, so some of the, um, you know, I'm a resource to the school, obviously. The administration, uh, Trina Roberts is here tonight. Uh, she's one of the assistant principals. And so they do their own investigation when it comes to school. If a child is under the influence or in possession of alcohol, they do their uh, disciplinary action. And that can be up to 10 day suspension in their handbook and then possible expulsion hearing on top of that and then alcohol programs. And then once they're done with their investigation, they forward that over to me. And that's where I uh, look at the uh, investigation work and determine whether there's charges and work with the uh, DA's office on that. So we really work together as a community, but our main goal is to quash it, or to basically help the students in, and find out where they're getting the alcohol, like Curtis said, and work from there. Uh, also, there's there's a disciplinary action with the schools as far as sports and um, after school programs and stuff, uh, student activities, that they can be banned from that as well as far as um, with alcohol consumption or, or selling alcohol on school grounds. So, like I said, I'm just a resource in the schools and if anybody has any questions or any information um, that they need to relate to myself or Detective Casella, they can, by all means, email us or give us a call. Detective McCasell is at the station. I'm here at the school. Uh, I have an office at the high school. And uh, we're open for any questions or anything like that at the end as well. Thank you so much. Um, we, we're, thank you. We're hearing such important information from all angles. And I think part of what we do as a community is kind of build this map in our head of the resources we have, uh, the opportunities we have, um, and then some of the challenges that anyone who's gonna use alcohol inappropriately will face, but that we have a responsibility to make sure our, our, our youth understand uh, before it comes uh, more naturally. Um, it's now my pleasure to introduce uh, Jennifer Puchalski and Melissa Lanzak, um, Hampton, uh, Wilbraham Regional School District uh, uh, Medical and Nursing Directors, and thank you for your time. Hello. So I'm Jennifer. I am, um, well, 
I was most recently the school nurse at Wolverhampton Middle School for the past 10 years. I recognize, thank you. Um, and I am this year the director of, or just started as the director of health services um, for, the, for the district. Hi there, my name is Melissa Lanzak and I'm the nurse coordinator for the school district. Um, prior to this role last year, I was a pediatric ICU nurse for about 12 years. So we're here tonight to talk briefly about SBIRT. And um, SBIRT is a screening tool that we use in the district. Um, it stands for uh, Screening, Brief Intervention, and Referral for Treatment, uh, if needed. Aspert was initially utilized in primary care settings as a screening tool, and it's since been added to the list of mandated screenings that schools have to do. Um, according to Mass General Law, public schools are required to provide verbal substance use health screenings in two grades. Um, in this district, we chose to do it in seventh grade and ninth grade. Um, it's the only approved screening tool that's available, DESE and Mass Department of Health have approved it. Um, the screening tool specifically addresses alcohol, nicotine, and other substances. Um, it was adapted for schools and piloted in, in Massachusetts starting in 2013. Um, and again, we, we do it in grades seven and nine. Um, the screening process for ESPER is anonymous and confidential, um, and we did hear what you guys mentioned about these screening tools and their accuracy, so we will take that back with us. Um, each year, a letter is mailed home to the families with students in grades 7 and 9. Um, within that letter, explains exactly what the screening consists of, um, when we're going to be completing it, and options to opt out. Um, every student that is screened is given a handout at the end of the screening process and that has tips for um, keeping youth healthy and there's actually a copy of that in the handouts that went out today. Um, the ESPER program reinforces healthy decisions and it addresses concerns about substance use to help improve the health, safety, and success of our students in school. Uh, I think everyone has this in their packet as well. This is the actual screening tool. Um, the way it works is a, a clinician, it's typically a nurse or a guidance counselor in the school, reads the, the questions word for word, one on one with a student. Um, prior to going forward, before the screening starts, um, you get verbal permission from the student to continue. And students can opt out at this point if they want to. Uh, I have to say, the couple years that I did it at the middle school, a handful of kids opted out at this stage, but very most were willing and, and kind of interested. It was new, um, you know, to, to see what we were going to say. So very few did opt out. Um, the the first question is really it talks about alcohol, and um, you go through all the questions the for, in, in part A, and then um, everyone gets asked that second question, in, or the, I'm sorry, that first question in part B, and really. The purpose of it is, is to create dialogue. Um, it's to, to have opportunities to offer education and to correct um, maybe perceptions that student ha students have about alcohol. Um, it also, I think, gives what I found was it gave opportunities to set up scenarios with students and say, okay, um, you're at the high school and you're getting a ride home from a friend and you feel like the friend's not quite right. What are you gonna do? And, and it just gave an opportunity to talk to students about some of those things and give them some tools, hopefully. Um, REACT stands for Reinforce, Educate, and Anticipate Challenges for Tomorrow. Students who screen negative will receive positive reinforcement for making healthy choices um, in addition to receiving tools to dip, uh, navigate some of those difficult social situations. Students who screen positive will be referred to school-based mental health professionals at a later date. Um, these screenings are kept confidential unless a staff person deems an immediate risk to student safety or someone else's safety. Um, and the referral to school-based mental health professionals is for the purpose of continued discussion, education, and support. So let's see, expert screening was started in 2018 in this district. Um, we didn't do it the past, well, the previous two years during COVID, so we're just sort of starting it again. So we haven't had a lot of years of doing it. 
Um, what we've learned is that the majority of students screen negative. Maybe that goes to your point that they're not being truthful. Um, I, again, I think when I did these screenings, I didn't feel like, oh, we're going to catch a bunch of kids or we're going to find out all this information about kids drinking. That, that really wasn't the goal. The goal, again, is to just kind of have a one-on-one -on -one real quick relationship with a student. And I saw kids, um, you know, you see a lot of kids in the nurse's office, but you don't get to see everyone. And we saw a lot of kids. You could just sit down very briefly and, and have this conversation with them. And I think the goal is to um, create a trusting relationship with an, with an adult in the building. And um, hopefully that helps students feel more secure, also helps students know there's someone they can go to if they have questions or problems. Um, so again, I don't think any of us really realized, really felt like the tool was it, I think it provided a different um, opportunity than we first thought when we started it. Um, data that we do collect is de-identified, so there's no names you know, associated, associated with it, but that data does get reported to um, the Mass Department of Public Health. Hopefully, with that data, um, supports are able to be offered to school districts as needed is the goal. Um, so when we're given these opportunities to sit down with some of these students that may not be frequent flyers in the nurses' offices, um, this gives us an opportunity to provide education to them. Um, so for the ones that screen negative, we can continue to say continue the good work, um, but we can also provide them education. So if they aren't being 100% truthful, we may be able to educate them with some information they might not already know. Um, so some of the short and long-term risks of alcohol use. For short-term risks, we have injuries such as motor vehicle accidents, falls and drownings, as was discussed earlier, violence, alcohol poisoning, which I saw very often in a pediatric ICU. A lot of experience I learned was around children in that environment um, and risky behaviors. We'll go to the next one. Um, long-term risks are high blood pressure, heart disease, stroke, liver disease, and digestive problems, along with cancer, weakening of the immune system, learning and memory problems, including poor school performance, um, which can be shown as higher rates of absenteeism, along with lower grades, mental health problems, including depression and anxiety, social problems, and alcohol dependence. And what teens aren't seeing is that many of these things will not happen immediately. Um, so educating them on what can occur later on is important. Every interaction that the nurses have and guidance counselors have with students, um, they're sort of always monitoring kind of for any concerns, warning signs. Um, this just shows some of the warning signs that parents can also look for. Um, change in mood, sleeping, uh, I'm sorry, for alcohol usage. Um, change in mood, sleeping or eating more or less than usual less interest in school, friends or activities, quality of school work is getting worse or skipping schools or classes, spending time with new friends you haven't met, money or other objects missing from the house, um, talking about parties where drug and alcohol are being used and rule breaking and just acting angry. Um, again, through these brief one-on-one -on -one conversations, Hopefully we're, we're giving students some tools to use um, and hopefully we're building some, a trusting relationship um, to support and educate students around um, substance use. So that's it in a nutshell. <laughs> um, just if you have questions or concerns, please reach out to your school nurses. They're a great resource. Melissa and I also are available for any, any questions. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, Hamden Wilbraham uh, School District has been uh, using uh, screening tools in a lot of areas for a long time. Uh, it's one of the most effective ways of working with the larger student body. I think it's certainly true that a screening will not always be uh, the, the most important tool for a single individual person, but in terms of making large group public health decisions, um, you can really commend this district for asking these questions in a broad way 
uh, the research tells us that just looking at data and using it in decision making improves outcomes, even though data says all sorts of different things. It's the process of doing that so, that's so important. Um, I also really appreciate your reminding us about the warning signs, and I'll just kind of say that um, uh, we adults get to know our kids, well, those that we have, those that we teach, those that we work with, and any of those changes that are enough to make you say what's going on are usually worth investigating uh, and asking about what people you care about. Uh, so now it's my uh, privilege to introduce, whoops, um, Abyssinia Hale um, to come up and share your thoughts. Thank you so much. So good evening everyone, my name is Abby Hale and I am a junior at Minichalk and I've been a part of the Above the Influence Club here for about three years. Um, the Above the Influence Club is one of Minichalk's several service clubs and the aim of the Above the Influence Club is just what it sounds like, it's to advocate to students the importance of staying above the influence and not under the influence. And throughout the club's several events throughout the year, we do a lot with promoting um, information about substance misuse and, you know, tackling um, that prevention at the ground level before, um, obviously, it can develop into a larger issue. And the club is actually one of um, Minichalk's several bigger clubs, um, which is pretty good. A lot of people have gotten involved, freshmen, um, sophomores, uh, juniors and seniors, so it's really good to see how many people are interested in uh, providing back to their communities and spreading awareness. Um, so today, um, I'll be speaking about some of our events that we've done uh, this school year that are centered around uh, substance prevent, uh, misuse prevention. Um, so at, at the beginning of this year, um, this fall, we did a Hamden PD um, night out, um, fall festival kind of thing at um, TWB. It was um, a kind of like arts and crafts night for children in the Hamden Wilbraham Regional School District to learn more about the importance of um, our police department, which definitely plays a huge role in preventing um, alcohol misuse and preventing that from spreading. We also do a Mir Vista Behavioral um, Health Hospital Clothing Drive for their Substance Abuse Unit, which is currently going on right now. Um, each January, the Above the Influence Club hosts a drive where students can donate certain clothing items um, to the uh, Behavioral Health Hospital, and then we have um, members of our club go physically to drop those um, items off. We also have a Black Balloon Day, which basically is um, every March, and it's to commemorate um, the, uh, and honor the lives of individuals who have passed as a result of substance misuse, and also to honor the families of those who have lost individuals to substance misuse. So what we usually and typically do is that we'll have um, uh, paper balloons that students can write their names on, and they will be posted on um, the walls in front of Mr. D'Alessio's Remark Club advisor, and then we take a picture. And it's really just to you know um, manifest some sort of uh, coalition and support for those who have lost um, family members, friends, and relatives to substance misuse. We also have um, guest speakers every once in a while who come and speak with us. It's uh, typically people who have had experience with substance abuse, whether they've been the abusers themselves or they've had um, experience with watching a loved one go through substance abuse. Um, last uh, Tuesday, actually, we had Adam Bartlett um, come speak with us. He was a former cop um, who was arrested in 2015 for robbing a pharmacy in Chicopee. So he talked with us on how it changed his path in life and how now he's doing better and he's giving back to his community by um, uh, hosting a lot of correctional um, events for people who are dealing with uh, substance misuse. And lastly, at the end of this year, we also host our ATI Club Walk. Um, every year we raise money and we do a very nice little um, uh, walk on Minichok's uh, Cross Country Trail. And um, tons of community members, students, families uh, will walk the country, uh, Cross Country Trail in support of 
the same values that I spoke about today, just preventing the um, promotion of the lifestyles of alcohol abuse, drug abuse, and rather preventing that at the grassroot level and, um, and letting people know that it is more important to be above the influence as a whole. So that's all I have for you guys today. And if you have any questions, you can either speak to me or Mr. Delestio. So thank you guys so much. Thank you so much. Uh, such important work uh, being done by uh, the leaders here, uh, student leaders in our community and future leaders in our country. Thank you so much to all the presenters and uh, to those of you who have joined us. We'd like to take some time to hear some of your questions. So if you would, um, maybe Bree, you could just walk around and gather any cards that people have. For those of you who may want to ask a question without coming to the mic, um, please just write it down on a card and pass it up and we'll take a look. Um, and we have some questions that were submitted by some of you at registration. I wanted to start and just find out, uh, are there any uh, questions that any of our student leaders would like to pose to anyone on the council first? Yeah, come on. Um, this was uh, specifically to you guys. Um, so I remember seeing on the thing, I actually, I would just like to say, I was a part of like the first class because 2018 I was in seventh grade during that time. But yeah, uh, yeah I do. Um, I remember it saying if you had a negative screen, you would congratulate them, da da da. Um, but if you had a positive screen, you would let like um, the counselors know and stuff like that. But you said that the survey is anonymous. So I think, I guess what I'm trying to ask is how does that work? Because I, I know when I was in seventh grade, that definitely caused some distrust with me. I'm not saying I lied on it, but I am saying that it could cause some distrust, especially with seventh graders and ninth graders. So I was just wondering, how does that work? Thank you. So I get it. Um, it, it is anonymous in terms of the, the reporting. So ideally, what would happen at that point if there were concerns that, that sort of came up, the idea is to then talk to that student and say, can we meet again and, and just have a conversation? Um, and that would be, again, informal and just um, to try to look at whatever behaviors, look at um, interest in trying to change any of those behaviors if the student had concerns. Um, and you try that you know, through the motivational interviewing and, and again, reinforcing positive behaviors and, and um, looking at what things you could do that you want to do to make changes. Um, so that, that isn't anonymous. Um, we don't, we're not, at that point, no one is calling a parent, no one is reporting that to anyone else in the school. It's just sort of a one-on-one -on -one, um, between you and the student. Um, if it, I, I think Melissa had mentioned, if there were things that were disclosed, which again, we hadn't found that that happens, but that were concerning and, and um, indicated how did you put it? Um, it's imminent, imminent. Yeah, unsafe. unsafe or you said something about somebody else that would put them in danger. Then that would be. Then, then you again are meeting with the student and meeting with guidance um, and and saying, hey, can we talk to your parent? You know, and and wanting to include the student in that conversation with the parent. We're never again unless it's unsafe, but we're not going to the parent and saying, hey, this student reported this. Um, but again, if it's, it's something that's imminent danger, then it's a conversation and saying, that's something I, I can't ignore and I have to report to someone. Does that help? Yeah? Okay. Thank you so much. And I think you're, uh, you know, one of the ways that I think about it is, um, you know, it's your job to keep people safe, but it's not your job to be catching them. Um, and I think a lot of times, uh, when youth are being asked questions like these, that these consequences that you imagine, um, you know, you, the focus is on what you have done or what you haven't done, and what we sometimes forget is that it's, it's our job as adults to try to find a way to gain your trust and support you and give you the supports that you need to, to do uh, your, your, your work of growing and leading. So um, we're doing our best. We really appreciate the feedback because, it, of course, we're not in your shoes. We haven't been in your shoes in a while. <laughs> um, 
Okay, can I uh, ask any other student questions before I put it out to the rest of the audience? Okay, you can raise your hand just like anyone else at any time. Is there, uh, does somebody want to ask a question uh, by raising their hand? Great. I'm going to go to you next. Uh, great presentation tonight. Uh, I'm Deacon Jim Zamba from St. Cecilia's, and I think we need to put the fear of God into the kids. But here's a question for Officer Dan. Sometimes I'm a substitute teacher here, and over at the middle school. The kids have water bottles, that their own personal water bottles. If I detect alcohol, smelling it, What's my course of action in the school? Yeah, so being a, a substitute, I would you know notify the administration and then that's when the admin kicks in and does their investigation. We'll call the student down and see if there's alcohol in that bottle. They also have um, breathalyzers too that they can uh, perform on students as well. And then the consequence will go that way. And then they'll call me in and then we'll deal with it as far as if it needs to be uh, a charge or whatnot or other further services that we have. So what should I do? I, I would call the admin. Yeah, call the administration. Um, and they come down to the classroom. They would escort the kid back and then they would do their one-on-one -on -one investigation. Make sure they don't leave the classroom. Absolutely, yeah, yeah. Okay. Hope I answered your question. Thank you. We had, uh, and you already have the mic. Yep, thank you. Um, I'm Melanie gagler Ducci. I'm a parent of a sixth and an eighth grader, and I'm actually a pediatric lung specialist who worked with Melissa in the ICU at Connecticut Children's. Um, so I guess it's not really a question, it's a clarification that we tend to think of alcohol as beer, wine, seltzers, spritzers, and some of those terms really make substances seem benign that have a very high alcohol content. And I think for several of the patients that we would have collaborated on, they thought that they were just drinking beer or a wine cooler. And when you look at the percentage of alcohol by volume, it's really, really high. People under the age of 21 should not be drinking alcohol, but math in their head is not really a strong point of many high school students. So I think in general, when we start thinking about alcohol, we really need to think about it as alcohol content and not say that you could drink a beer or an eight ounce glass of wine and then be fine to do something because it really depends on the alcohol content, not the substance being consumed. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, Everything is relative, right? Everything requires some individual judgment and some, some knowledge. We have a question back there, Bree. Oh, okay. Yep, and then back there. Thank you, good evening everybody. My name is Veronique Leroy and I have a fourth grader and an eighth grader. And my question is to everyone on the panel. One of the things that really attracted us as a family moving here to Wilbraham was um, definitely the school district and the sense of community. Um, and one of the things we started experiencing since my daughter started middle school was going to the football games, right? And soccer games and all these gatherings here on the, on the sports field. I honestly, in the beginning, was there with her then last year, I kind of let her go with her friends, you know, try to have her space. I felt it was a safe space because uh, it's school grounds, right? And you have to pay a ticket and pretty much you know who's there. And then one time we just came to pick her up and I started seeing, you know, kids vaping. Like I could see them everywhere and I didn't see any measures or any adults like taking care of that. And my daughter actually mentioned that she knows some of the kids bring alcohol to these um, events. So my question is, like, if I'm there and I see it, how do I report it? And what is the school district doing to prevent things like this from happening? How are we screening, if we can, um, you know, to prevent alcohol to be brought or even, you know, vaping um, devices to these type of events to keep them safe? for all the kids and everybody. 
Yeah, great question. Um, so we always have detail officers that are on the grounds of those events, uh, football games, lacrosse games. So if you see us around, by all means, come over to us and let us know. And there's also admin staff that is at every game, at least five or six. And we try to wear uh, the fluorescent uh, yellow vests. So by all means, come out to us and let us know if there's a problem and we'll investigate it and get admin involved and handle it accordingly. And uh, I forget what the other end of the question was. Uh, thank you. And I, I want to point out that a lot of the scenarios that we're imagining are complex. Uh, they're stressful, they're uncertain, and there's, uh, there's a bit of a tension between how do you react to the incident that has already happened, and how do you, over the course of time and through deep investment in your community, create the kind of environment where these conversations can happen more easily, and where responses can happen more naturally and become part of the fabric of the community. And so there's a way in which the answer is always keep building better, and of course, we need to rely on our experts in these moments where response is required. I appreciate that feedback. It's good for us all to hear about your experience. Um, right in the back. Hi, uh, sorry. My name is Sarah Wickham. Um, I have a 10th grader here at Minichog who just um, transferred from WMA. Um, and I'm curious about the expert screening and why grade seven and nine were chosen. So why were grades seven and nine chosen as your screening grades? That's a good question. I, I'm not sure. I, I know it was, I, I think there was hesitancy when we started it to go younger than that. I'm not sure that hesitancy should still be there. Um, we certainly can look at it and, and make changes, um, you know, and start in a younger grade. Um, I, I think when it first came out, everyone was kind of like, oh, what are we doing? You know, we weren't sure about it. Um, should we be doing it in all grades? Should we, you know, I, I, those are all good questions. I'm thinking, but I don't know if it's the true answer. So seventh grade, we're still in the middle school, right? Before we enter into high school where more things are offered or situations arrive. So I would think seventh, we're in that middle school range and then ninth we're into the high school, there is a thought that beyond that point, you you know, we're trying to let them develop those skills and how to navigate those social situations. So we want to try to address them before we get to there, but the thought of doing it sooner, you know, may need to be adjusted as time goes on. Yeah, I, I um, um, I, almost wonder, I, I, I'm a huge advocate of prevention, so I like the idea of starting early, but I also wonder, looking at your YRBS data and looking at grades where kids are using more often, if it might be more helpful to be looking at those grades where kids are reporting more use. Sarah, I think that's a really good point and certainly something to take a look at in terms of broadening it. What we do know from what we learn from students that develop more problem um, drinking or other substance use is that these things can start a lot earlier than we recognize. And so there is definitely some value to opening those conversations early because really it is opening the door to the discussion and communicating that sense of this is important, important enough for us to talk to you about it and maybe plant those seeds. So I, I would absolutely love to look at the idea of bringing SBART even further up. I think our YRBS data um, certainly gives us a good pulse point. It's not the same as a screening, it's a survey. Um, but I think the value of the seventh and ninth is also important to think about. Asking these questions is so important. You know, as parents, we know that we need to talk to our kids, and as community leaders, we need to talk to our groups of kids. So appreciate the, the feedback and the opportunity to think about uh, asking children more often and, and younger. Thank you. Are there other questions? Yeah. Um, I'm Deanna Farrell. I do have a question when Detective Casello was speaking. 
um, you know, all of the statistics and things that you were saying, how much, and maybe no one even knows the answer to this, and you might, but I don't want to put you on the spot. What are the students in our district taught in like health classes? Like, are some of these really important things that you, that the detective spoke about? Do the, are the students learning these things at these young ages? Yeah, I think you know when when you start to talk about curriculum-based stuff, we don't necessarily come into play. Um, I'm sure that it's addressed, and certainly if anyone has the answers to those questions, feel free to speak up. But you see a, a bunch of students here that are involved in groups that are taking those extra measures to, to educate themselves and classmates about these issues. Um, I'm of the mindset that I think having people like you see before you going into the classrooms and presenting information like this would be extremely beneficial. I, I don't, I'm not aware uh, that that happens or not. Right. So I, I do know this, that uh, there, I've gone to other districts, I've done um, presentations for the middle school teachers, which is great because, you know, detection is, is a phenomenal tool, but I, I think your point is well taken as far as, you know, whether that is, in, is part of the curriculum or not. So I don't have a solid answer to that question. I have some of the questions that were submitted early. I'm perusing them to see if there, any of them might have already been addressed or polls, but I, I want to stick uh, first to others that are in the room. Yeah. So again, about the survey you guys were talking about, is it advertised on the beginning that the survey is completely anonymous, or is it advertised that if you are positive that you are going to be spoken to? At the start, I mean, there's a letter sent to parents and that explains some of what you're asking. And then at the start of, you probably didn't get it done because of, because of COVID. Yeah, yeah. Um, at the start of the interaction with the student, you do make that statement that if there is something that you disclose that um, I feel would put you at risk, um, then we would have further conversation. Um, in the letter, it actually talks about um, it's confidential and won't be shared with any other person without prior written consent. Um, this is what the letter has lots of words. Um, but they do explain that to you that during it. Did you have a follow up? Yeah. Um, so, as like that parent, that letter sent to the parents. I know like a lot of people when they get letters in the mail from their school, like the teens don't read it. So I think that could definitely be a problem if they're told it was anonymous and then, oh, all of a sudden they get this call from the nurse's office, hey, like, um, Emily, like you need to go down and then they start talking about you. I think it could definitely cause a, like a distrust and a disconnect between the student and the nurse. However, I do think it's probably helpful if you were to address the students on a larger scale, say, hey, part of your class tested positive on the survey. Let's talk about the things your class is doing good and some things that you can prove on instead of doing that student to teacher connection because I feel like that could kind of create a negative interaction for the student. It's so complex, right? Because um, legally we're asking for parents' consent, but you're talking about assent of, of the student and, and informed consent, knowledge about what you're going to be asking. I have a question. I don't know if you can answer it. But there may be a difference between the types of questions you can privately and confidentially ask your own healthcare provider and one you can ask a, a, a school affiliated healthcare provider. Um, do you know about a, a pathway that a student who wants to have a completely private and confidential question about their sexual health or alcohol substance abuse treatment options, is that something they can do with their provider? Do you, let me, I'm going to answer it the way I think you're asking it. So no matter what setting you're in, whether you're coming to the hospital and you're seeing me in the ICU and you're telling me I went to this party and X, Y, and Z happened, if it is something that needs to be reported, like mandated reporters we are, it has to be reported um, for the safety. Is that what, was that your question? Your question? Yeah. I think it is, and I, I'm reluctant. 
That's right. Mandate reporting is key. There, I, I think I'm going to leave it a little bit as an open question rather than answer it incorrectly. Um, but that is to say that uh, there are areas of your health care where even as a minor, you are permitted to seek health care without your parents' knowledge or consent. And so I would encourage you all to ask your physicians that very question directly and succinctly. What, what are the things that we can talk about? Um, the, the whole concept is that everyone should be able to get health care uh, when they need it. So, and you've really, you've really raised some of the, the, the tricky spaces in between confidentiality and anonymity and all of us working together to stay healthy. Thank you so much. Oh, great. Oh, yeah, thank you. We have someone up front first, and then we'll... we'll... I don't want the students to come away with the wrong impression. So, as a, as a minor, you can seek health care and counsel from a physician for any private matter regarding sex, drugs, alcohol, or even mental health. The only reason that things would get disclosed for your parents would be for suicidal or homicidal ideation. But otherwise, all of your health care is private, and now with electronic medical records, every visit that I have with an adolescent where I ask questions about sex, drugs, alcohol, or something that they don't want me to share with a parent is marked as sensitive and private, and your parents don't have access. So don't ever hesitate to share something with your doctor, your APRN, or a healthcare provider because we're only here to help you and your privacy is protected. Thank you so much. We really appreciate you just weighing in. Um, and you know, I'll just share, when I'm working with somebody and I may be talking to them about suicidality, uh, what I say is anything I share, I'm sharing to help your adult self, the self that's gonna be healthy and looking back at this moment and uh, being glad that you paused enough to seek help and counsel. So thank you for bringing your expertise here. Question here, front. Yeah, this is a question for, I'm Alex Baker, by the way, um, for the district attorney's office. Um, I mentioned, or I saw that you, um, for the attempt to acquire, one of the penalties was a 180 day loss of license. Is that correct? Um, if they are under the age of any kind of driving um, permissions, like a permit or a license, if they're under that age, is there any other um, consequence other than the license, loss of license? I think there was a fine as well. Yeah, there was a fine. Uh, I think the issue is, like, let's say you're under 16, you don't even have a license, so yeah. where's the penalty, right? Uh, if there was an actual conviction or a finding, the registry gets that, and then there would be more difficulties in getting your license, potentially. So the registry is a whole other separate uh, entity in how you get your license and problems that you may have done in trying to get it. Uh, whether it, Underage drinking may be involved, so you may have a license. Uh, you're driving a car and you're 15, you get an OUI. With or without a license, you're still gonna have potential penalties for driving that vehicle without a license, driving under the influence, so there's penalties for that, whether you're licensed or not. And uh, if you have some type of conviction, those kind of penalties through the registry still would potentially follow you. Okay, great. And I just had one more point um, to Janet's question. The state requires health educators and physical educators to have standards. Unfortunately, those standards haven't been updated since 1999 through the state. Um, that's currently in the process of being uh, reviewed and a draft has been sent to the Department of Ed, I think this past fall. So those state standards are being revised, obviously keeping up with the times because in 1999, the internet was a fax machine made of wood. Thank you. Um, we have time for about one more question. Uh, right there in the back, I'm gonna run up to you. Are you, are you gonna go? Are you gonna run faster? Okay. Da -na 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 -na. There she goes, thank you, Bree. the whole uh, spectrum here, right? And um, as a parent, you know, you, you try your best, but you're embarrassing to your kids. It is what it is, right? So the question is actually for having the students on the board, what what do you tell your friends, you know, to get them to have something in their tool belt to say when they're at a situation, um, you know, to, to say no, right? To say no is not cool. 
So what, what do you say when you're in that situation um, to, to be okay and still be accepted, still be you know, part of your peer group? Um, for me personally, for my whole life, this has just been a value that's been instilled through my parents, through the people who I've grown up around. Um, I really just don't care. And I know that's like hard for a lot of students to grasp, but at the end of the day, when you see people that you know, people that you love be impacted and affected by the decisions of themselves or others regarding alcohol consumption under age, it really puts into perspective um, that the realities of um, underage drinking are real and that they do have repercussions. You know, I've witnessed and I've seen people who I love be impacted by it and it's tough. Um, and I would never want myself or anyone else around me to also be um, victim to that as well. So for me, it's like a very easy thing to say no, but I know, understand for other people it might be a little bit difficult. So I just encourage them to think about themselves, not even in just in, in the introspective self, but also those around and to think into the future rather than just the now and how one sip or one uh, shot might change the whole trajectory of the rest of their life. Thank you so much. Does that, do any of you also want to address that question? And we'll probably close on this. Um, sorry. For me, uh, personally, when talking with my friends, or like just anyone that I know who do it, I come to them obviously as a peer, um, where like I explain all these things to them and I tell them that I'm here for them and that if they ever need help to call me or whatever, I can't do much, but I have no problem being a narc, and if they really have a problem, I have no problem calling police, telling my parents, telling an adult. And I think it's a really big thing where we have to tell kids, if it gets to that point, tell an adult, tell someone, because you may think that you're saving them by not telling their parents, not telling an adult now, but if anything, you're doing more damage to them. They can end up dead, they can end up in a lot of situations, and you don't want that for your friends. So you definitely have to drill that, not drill it, but tell your, tell your kids, look out for your friends as well, look out for your peers. You don't want your peers to be on the headline of the news the next day saying that they died. So just advocate for that. Thank you so much. These questions, uh, the comments and the presentations from our, our panel here have just been so value, valuable. We have a couple of things we want to close with, and I just want to share my gratitude to all of you for the expertise you brought. And you, you know, there's there's not much more to say that I can add, um, other than what we what we have here is a room full of of parents and students and people with different backgrounds and different areas of of interest and expertise. Um, we're a community. We are partners. Uh, the power in what we do is not in the individual work that happens at the DA's office or in my, you know, uh, therapy office or in our nurses' uh, offices. The power comes through how we collaborate, how we work together. Um, I'm really proud to see what this community has pulled together. And um, I have a lot of aspirations and hopes for how uh, statewide and across the Commonwealth, schools and mental health and uh, health care uh, and students <laughs> will partner in working on these problems. So I encourage you to just remember that you're part of this community, you're voters in this community, uh, you likely uh, uh, pay your insurance company for healthcare. Um, we need to bring our voices to this. And I'm so appreciative you've come today. I wanna in reintroduce and bring back Gina, who's uh, really brought us all here today and give her a chance to close us out. Thank you. Just for a moment, I'm not the closer. We are gonna hear from Bri in a moment. But thank you so much, Chris, for your excellent navigation through this, through the, uh, through the tricky waters of our topic. And our panel has been phenomenal. Youth Advisory Board, oh my goodness, amazing. Thank you so much. This is where I get myself into trouble um, because basically we are all the superstars tonight who are in this room. So, but there are a couple of people that I that I want to just mention specifically. Um, and I want to give a big thank you to Dave Sanders, who's in the back here, and he is a Wilbraham Public Access volunteer 
who has recorded this session so that people who were not here with us tonight will have the opportunity to see it and hopefully benefit from it. Thank you so much, Dave. Our junior women's club volunteers that helped us so wonderfully with the check-in. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And again, I, I don't want to leave anyone out, but um, not with us right now, but with us earlier, our, our chief of police at Wilbraham, Chief Fleming was here, and also our, our superintendent, John Provost, and they both gave a big thumbs up as they, as they did need to leave. We have some wonderful members of our coalition here, and I'm not going to signal anyone out, but you know who you are. And as I said in the beginning, if you're here tonight, you're all members of the coalition, so too late. You're, you're now all part of it. Thank you, Jared. And um, we also have a, a couple of teachers here with us tonight, and we do appreciate so much, Courtney and Alex, for being here tonight, and good questions, thank you. Um, with that, I really do owe one more thank you, Janet Farrell from our office, who's amazing and keeps us all organized. But the person that really, really is the driving force behind tonight, my pleasure to introduce you to the Coalition Coordinator, Bree Burnish. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Um, just echoing everything Gina said, thank you all so much for being here, and thank you so much for the panelists. and. For the students, your input is so invaluable, and I know that other students really want to hear from you all, so thank you so much for everything tonight. Um, so before we go, I just want to wrap up really quickly. Um, in your folders, you have a piece of paper for an evaluation form. We would appreciate it so much if you could fill it out. Um, whichever is easier for you, there's a paper copy if you want to just fill out the paper copy and we can drop it in a bag in the back there or hand it to me. Or there is a QR code on the form if you want to just take a minute and fill in. Um, I think there's like five, maybe seven, I don't know, a couple questions. Um, just about tonight, it gives us some really great feedback to know how to go forward with events in the future. Um, and your comments are really valuable to us, so we would greatly appreciate it. You can also just use your phone and scan the QR code up there for some easy access as well. Um, so also now for the exciting part, we have some gift cards that were donated by Bethlehem Church, so thank you to them so much for their donations. So we're going to draw a couple names and hand out some gift cards. So you have your choice of a $20 Big Y gift card or a $20 Rice's gift card. So who and, wants to pick a name? <laughs> and while we're getting, we're going to ask our youth advisory board members to pick a name, okay? Here, here you go. You can use that. There you go. I can. <laughs> okay. I, the last name is Kim. I'm so sorry, I don't know how to pronounce the first name, so I'm going to spell it. M-Y-U-N-G-S-E-O-B. Yeah. Okay, we're sorry about that, but we're going to pick another sorry. name. We're going to pick another one. <laughs> okay, you're next. Oh, me? Yep. Okay. Oh. That would be funny. Yeah. Krista Brogel. Yay. Yay. All right, Krista. Yay. All right. So you can come down here and take your pick of a Big Y or a Rice's gift card and a, a lunch bag from the coalition. And while we're doing this, we want to remind you that you can, anytime you want, take a youth mental health first aid course that the coalition provides for absolutely free for groups of five or more. So you can actually, if you have a group of five or more or people that you'd like to get together, we would be happy to bring it to you. We can also do it virtually. Or you can join a course when we are offering them. So please keep that in mind. There is a flyer for mental health first aid in your folder, so if you have any questions about it or if you'd like to learn more, my, oh my contact gosh. information is on there. I picked up myself. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 All right. You okay. Do you want big one or nice gift bar? Oh yeah.
We've got one more gift card okay. to give away. One more. Will you do it? Oh, no. No, you don't want to do it? Okay. Yeah. Let's hear it. Can you pick yourself Oh, Autumn Mathias. Oh, she, le she left. Okay. Okay. Oh, yeah, okay. You can pick. Oh, wait, wait, wait. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I think this one's done. You did? Yeah! Uh, we can repick. No, no, no. Okay. Oh, Matthew Favada. <laughs> So with that, even if you did not win a door prize, I hope that you feel like being here tonight was a gift, and it certainly was a gift to us that you took the time and spent this evening with us. Thank you so much. In early March, we will be getting back together for a um, digital media awareness night, and um, I think, what's the date on that? March, when, Wednesday, Wednesday, March 1st. Yes. With Dr. I get this wrong, Michael Rich, who is from Harvard Children's Hospital and the founder director of the Digital Media Wellness Center for Youth. He's written books, he's amazing, and we all know that this is a topic of great interest. So please put that, we'll be sending information out shortly. Make sure that's on your calendar. Don't be shy about reaching out to us and coming to coalition meetings and being part of this, um, this wonderful community of prevention and care for our students. I forgot to mention Tony and Gina. Thank you for being here tonight. Thank you all for being here tonight.